Hello and welcome to another episode of the Innovate on Purpose podcast brought to you by The Mindful Innovator, where we help leaders find clarity so they can grow their business purposely. We share mindful tips, innovative solutions, and purposeful leadership advice that you can apply immediately to your business and life. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Greg Davis, who holds numerous certifications, is retired as an award-winning University of Illinois professor of accounting and senior finance executive. Greg had the privilege to work 23 years at Hershey Entertainment and Resorts, the world-renowned entertainment company based in Hershey, PA, with a lifetime supply of chocolate, I'm sure. With a unique perspective, he has been successful in both the corporate world and academia, in addition to being a professor, a professional finance blog writer. Greg, thank you so much for being here on the show today. Oh, you're welcome, Matt. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, awesome. Um, Greg, I had a chance to read your book, meet you in person. I actually have a signed copy of it right here, <laughs> which is absolutely awesome to have. You're um, welcome. This is a great book, something that's helped me on my journey. So I just want to personally thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I really appreciate you uh, reading it. Of course. Uh, I would love for you just to, in your own words, talk to people here about your book, Checkmate, and kind of the um, the back origin of, the, of how did the book come about and what's, what, why should people pick it up? Yeah, great. Uh, no, um, when I was a teach, when I was a professor out of Illinois uh, for seven years, I really had the opportunity to meet a lot of students in, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And I think it was in one of those coffee chats where I was having coffee with one of my students, where I was telling a story from my career at Hershey, and they were just soaking it in. They were loving life, right? This is great. They had a lot of nuggets there for them, and they basically said, you know, Professor Davis, you should really just write a book so that we could all share in some of the experiences you've had. And that was. Seriously, that was the genesis for the book like six, seven years ago. Um, and then I waited till I retired till I actually had, in my opinion, enough time to write a book. And so that's really the genesis for the book. And I, I really felt the timing was good because in 2022, when I started the book, we had just come out of the two years of the pandemic. And quite honestly, a lot of people were unhappy. And I thought maybe a book on happiness would kind of help my readers get through some of that post-pandemic uh, situation. Yeah, and that's so key. It definitely, there's, there's a lot of burnout right now within, you know, in the United States and I'm sure world as well. But just, uh, you know, huge on the burnout issue. Leaders not sure, you know, are they in a place they want to go, again, where they want to be? Um, and figuring out, you know, what company can I work for that I, I will feel better at? And a lot of people are interning to like, you know, I'm going to open my own business. Yeah, I might know one or two. <laughs> yeah, locally personally. here that are, yeah, personally here that are uh, are deciding to to leave the corporate world all to find that happiness. It's so important, and I think the book is very timely. Um, now, Checkmate uh, is an acronym, right? So yeah, it is. Uh, I, I kind of developed some of my themes around that that word. Plus, also obviously, there's a lot of analogies throughout the book to the game of chess, which I absolutely love. But uh, just to talk about the the, the checkmate. The C is for career change, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, at, at different levels of our career, we think about making a career change, but they're hard, right? That's a hard thing to do when you're very comfortable in your current situation, and sometimes it's just easier to go day to day than worry about that career change. The H stands for happiness, no surprise, uh, in Checkmate. And I do talk a lot about uh, things in, in our crazy world today. There's so much stress around us, and we see the daily news, which is typically negative. We need to make ourselves get outside of that rut and, and make ourselves get in more happy mode. Uh, the E in Checkmate is ensure that you have quality time for family. And that's the very first chapter in my book. And it's probably the most important, in my opinion. And C is actually kind of a tougher one. It stands for cancer and other diseases that we and our family members face. And I talk about that in the book as well with my wife's cancer in 2018. Uh, the K is knowing that age is really just a number because as we get older, we always think, oh, my gosh, when I turn 40 and Matt, this is going to be hard for you to think about. But when it turn 40, it's, I'm old, right? 50, I'm really old. And, and really, the thing was 60 is where well, you're pretty much on your deathbed, right? But in today's world, I mean, I'm about to turn 64 next week. I still feel very young. And I think things like uh, that I talk about in checkbook uh, of getting outside of your comfort zone and doing new things help you do that, help you keep young. Um, the M is for money, because I do talk about finances in the book. Uh, I'm not an expert by any means, but I basically share some of my life experiences that my wife and I have done to, for us to achieve a happy uh, early retirement. 
Uh, a in, in checkmate is for a job that has special meaning. We'll talk about that more, I'm sure. The T is take time to find a good life partner because I think that's critical to any successful life. And E is enjoy retirement, which I'm doing by being on your podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, I love every letter of that acronym uh, because I see how they can integrate together where it's, it's not you know just about finding your professional purpose and, and you know being successful. You know, success, absolutely. We're, we all want that. I mean, sure. I want my business to flourish. Um, if I'm in a co corporate position, I, I want to get that promotion. We want to get that pat on the back for sure. Um, but that's not the only thing that's important, right? But I think we kind of do get sucked into that success, like rut, to where all of a sudden we forget about like all those other things that you mentioned. Like, you know, you talk about your wife having cancer. That's, that's hmm. you know, a really tough moment. And, and it right. really does. I think those moments all of a sudden start to change your perspective. And how do you, you know, balance out life to, to make sure that you are taking care of that personal stuff as well with the, with the professional. But, yeah, that's a great point, Matt. You know, I've had a number of people who have read the book and, and this is an interesting comment I've gotten from them is by reading my book, they've realized that the pandemic changed the way they, and quite honestly, pretty much all of us have viewed our work, right? I mean, I think prior to the pandemic, it was like work, 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 and then family and, and other <laughs> other fun issues kind of secondary and, and tertiary to that. But I think the pandemic made us focus on, are we really happy in, in our current jobs? And a lot of us aren't, right? I mean, mm -hmm. all of us are not. And thus we've had a tremendous uh, career change environment over the last three years. And I think we're still in that to some degree as people work from home and are moving back to maybe the office environment they don't care for anymore. So I think to your point, uh, I think the pandemic has really changed the way we look at work and maybe maybe we, we change our value system a little bit that works not that you got to go do that. Number one, we should also be thinking about family and other uh, more enjoyable experiences we can do with others. Yeah. And, and Greg, you mentioned like that, uh, finding the happiness in the work that you do. Um, can you tell our audience a little bit more about how do you, how do you, where do you start like to find happiness at work? Yeah. I'm like, in a job where I am not happy. Um, the boss is, always breathing down my neck. I feel micromanaged. Like, how do I get happy? Yeah, that's a great question. That's not an easy answer, right, for any of us. But I think what's important for us all to realize that for your listeners is sometimes we have to kind of step back from that day-to-day -day activity and just truly understand, am I really, am I really where I want to be in my career? And, and, you know, maybe we've been at a job 8, 10, 12 years, and we think we're kind of stuck in that rut forever. And I'll just give an example that uh, that happened for me and it's in the book is that, you know, I had been at Hershey, uh, I worked for Hershey Entertainment Resorts, phenomenal company, one of the top entertainment companies in the whole world, quite honestly, it's a world-class organization. I'd been there for 23 years and, and I was starting to think as quite honestly, some really life-changing events around me were happening. A really good friend of my wife and I died at age 48 from a sudden heart attack and he worked in the company as well. So I found that you know, and that, that kind of reset for my wife and I, who was, she was a busy pathologist in the medical world. She was working like 65, 70 hours a week. And I was working crazy hours as well. And I think that reset from, from our good friend, Frank's passing at age 48 made us re, re reset and think, okay, let's refocus on what's important in life. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm doing what I need to be doing to make myself and, and my wife and I happy. So I think that's what we have to kind of inwardly do and it's hard to do that when you're in the day-to-day -day activity but at some point you have to step back and say is this really where i want to be and i made the difficult choice in 2013 to leave hershey and quite honestly pursue something i've been doing as a part-time person which was teaching in a college environment and i think for me matt that was truly what i'd say was my why in life right i mean you always try to hear this crazy term what's your why in life Mm -hmm. But it's important. I think you have to figure out what, what are you good at and where do you bring the most to the table for others to benefit from your experiences. And for me, it was teaching. Mm -hmm. And so I think I left an incredibly positive environment at Hershey, but stressful also in a lot, of, a lot of extents. And I left that in 2013. And then in 2014, I finally took a teaching job out in University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. And that was a really tough transition for both my wife and I, because we basically uprooted from our roots in Pennsylvania, moved 700 miles to Champaign, Illinois, to a 
to a job I really didn't know how I would do in a full-time mode. I'd only done it part-time prior to that as an adjunct. Mm-hmm. And secondarily, it, it took both my wife and I have our very comfortable jobs, which were quite honestly well-paying jobs. And it was a tough decision to make. And quite honestly, there were a lot of skeptics around us, friends and family who probably thought we were uh, nuts, quite candidly. <laughs> um, but it was a tough decision. And we, we never looked back. It was a very good mm-hmm. decision for both of us. What was your response to the people that looked at you like you were nuts for doing it? Yeah, it was a tough response because I'll be honest, I had some really close family members who would say, oh my gosh, Greg, what are you thinking? You and your wife have incredible jobs. You're very well entrenched in the central Pennsylvania area with lots of friends and family. What are you doing to uproot and move away? And my comment was, I- I'm, we're actually looking for more happiness in life. You know, I mean, uh, my wife was very stressed in her medical job. I was fairly stressed in my high level. Uh, at one point, I was a CFO for the organization for 18 months. And it was a very stressful year and a half for me. And so my answer to them was, we're trying to see- seek out happiness. And, and, you know, the money the money is, you know, we all think about money as the only thing that drives us in our, in our careers. But as I found out as I got into my 50s and, and so forth, and my wife and I both realized this, that money's not the only thing in life. I mean you got to be able to be happy to enjoy what you do have, right? So I think our, our answer to those skeptics was we're searching happiness. And as I think as people saw us then throughout that seven years involved involve into much happier couple, we were much happier when we came back to family events in Pennsylvania because it was such a special time for us to come back to those. And I, th- I think that's a hard answer for people to understand, but I think seeking happiness was the key for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's super honorable, and uh, I mean, I'd probably be floored, like you know, thrown back a little bit by by hearing like you know, well, I just want to be happy. It's like <laughs> that that is truly uh, a remarkable reason to do it, and so important. Uh, now you mentioned also um, you have to take a step back out of the day to day, so you can recognize this. Unfortunately for you, it was your your, your friend. Right. Uh, 48 years old who passed away and that's uh it's usually those like life moments where we we have those like reflective times of like okay am i really where i want to be and it was like right. a wake-up call but um I, hopefully not not everybody has to experience that wake-up call. yeah yeah that, that, that's my one takeaway in the book is that you know i, I do I, and i've had people who commented on the book about this is gosh I, do i have to wait till somebody dies close to me to actually change careers and my answer to that is hopefully not right i mean Hopefully it doesn't take a life changing event to that degree for us to actually step back. I think the pandemic has done that for us, Matt. I think the pandemic has kind of forced us to be much more introspective into our careers and, and just to make sure we're not just doing it for the, you know, the, the once a month paycheck or because we've been there for so long. There's such easy answers to stay at a job, yeah. but I think it's really hard for us. And it's something we all need to do a little bit better job at is step back sit down with your spouse, maybe go off on a retreat for a couple of days or what have you, go to a nice vacation and sit down in a relaxed environment and say, is this where we want to be? And, and that's a hard answer for all of us to face. But I think if you do it with your spouse in a more of a casual environment, as opposed to that day-to-day stuff we kind of deal with in the evenings, I think it's much more, uh, we're more introspective to be open to new ideas. Mm-hmm. And also you mentioned that, um, teaching made you happy, right? You had to find your happiness. Now, working as the CFO at Hershey, uh, doing that work in the day-to-day, how did you know that like teaching was the thing that was going to make you happy? Yeah, great question. I, I, I was CFO for, like I say, 18 months, and it was the most stressful time of my career at Hershey because up to that time, I've been corporate controller, budget director, really enjoyed that role. And then kind of the CFO just kind of got laid on top just for a period of time while my, while my prior boss was doing another task for the uh, Hershey entities. And I think for me, the, the challenge was, okay, how do I, how do I now get out of this rut? Because I was enjoying what I was doing, but I was, the stress was just amazing because of the hours and so forth. So I think for me, it was trying to find out um, what really would make me happy. And so I started teaching in the evenings, like twice, twice a week, uh, as an adjunct professor for a local college. It was Lebanon Valley College in Lebanon, PA, near Hershey. And as I was finding out, Matt, every morning I would wake up on that Tuesday and Thursday when I knew I was going to be in class that night, even my wife, Abby, would notice like, oh my gosh, you are so much happier. 
And it's because I knew I had that classroom environment to go to at the end of the day, even after a busy work day at Hershey. So I think, it, you know, as, as weird as it sounds, that happiness that I had in the classroom permeated through me whenever I wasn't there. And on the days I knew I was going to be in the classroom, I was a much happier individual, even though I knew I had to go face a day at work at Hershey before getting there. And, and I think mm-hmm. I think what I found out is being in the classroom for me and sharing my experiences with with you know, young, intelligent students in the classroom was really that why I had been looking for. Yeah, I, that's awesome. Where you're able to um, be able to balance it all out and like just not jump two feet into the pool right away, but you were able to kind of test it out. So I guess that would kind of be my insight there for for folks is like, you know, if you're searching for your happiness, if you're not happy with your current role, um, what can you test out? How can you test certain things out to see if this is a thing that's going to spark you? Because, I mean, you were able yeah. to get through a tough day. At, yeah, that's, go- a, that's a great point. In fact, this is a really relevant topic because just about a week ago, I had a 30-some-year-old lady who approached me. She had read my book, and she knew my wife through a, through a, a dragon boat racing team here in Philly. And she said, I have a question for you. She says, that career change thing that you talked through in your book, she says, I'm just curious it's something I know I need to do, but I, I'm, I don't know how to do it. And my comment to her was what well, you just said, you have to test some other things out. Is there other things you want to try and do? Like she was in a medical field and it was burning her out, quite honestly. And I said, what else do you like to do? And her comment was, I want to, as silly as it sounds, be a social worker, help other people. So I said, well, as you just mentioned, what I would suggest is go do it on the part-time basis, whether it's on the weekend for a couple hours a week or couple evenings, maybe test something else out while you're still actively employed. See if that's where that happiness that you were looking for is, is actually at. And then that could be the transition mode for you to move into that type of role. So I think you're, I think that's a, a really good thing for your listeners to, to know, Matt, is, you know, we all get so ingrained in our job, we don't think we can do anything else, but we know there's other things out that we should be doing. I think you have to test them out on a part-time basis, uh, whether it's a couple hours a week and just kind of see if that's something that really, you know, makes you much more of a happier individual and more worthwhile for your, for your efforts. Yeah. And I, I think there's also um, a, a secondary way to do that as well. Like where, you know, what are the things that light you up? And if it's teaching, great. Um, how can you teach in your current role, right? Can you take on a couple of protégés and, and mentor folks within the organization and see if that sparks you. Uh, yeah. so, so there might be ways to test out these like these things that you love in the current role that you're in. Yeah, you know, to that point, it's a great, great acknowledgement, Matt, for your readers and your listeners, because I, I think what happened for me, and I thank Hershey for this, is they knew I had an interest in teaching. I was doing it as an adjunct professor at local colleges. So they came to me, actually, my the CEO at the time, Bill Simpson, who was a tremendous leader for me throughout the company, throughout my 20 some years. He came and says, hey, I know you're teaching on the side. We think we need to teach more of our people out in the field. At, again, it's a hospitality and entertainment company. How our finances work in the company. Now, think about this. There's not many companies that do this, right? You're a person working the front gate of the amusement park. You're 22 years old. You have no idea how much, company, how much money the company makes and how to even make their money, right? So what we did, we started to develop courses on the finances of the company. And we taught them how to read financial statements. We taught them how the work they do at the park, you know, drives the revenue and the income for the company and where, and where we share those profits, which was a phenomenal mission. We share those profits to generate um, money to run the local school, the Milton Hershey School in Hershey, PA. So, you know, I think I thank Hershey for giving me that opportunity to teach it within the company, first mm-hmm. of all. Uh, and then also just to acknowledge that I had that skill set and I could use that within my current job there at Hershey to kind of help people understand how the company operates much better from a financial position. Yeah, that's, that's so cool where you were able to use that that um, that skill set. They saw what you were doing and then all of a sudden, yeah. like, you know what, this actually could apply to the work that you're already doing. Yeah, and, and, and I, again, I love the company for doing that because that, that was very appreciative. That was kind of probably the linchpin for me to really get into teaching full time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow. So, so you made the jump. Uh, you took the pay cut. Uh, I can only imagine there must have been some times of like, what the heck was I thinking? What did I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, there, there's some times, uh, I'll just share this with you because yeah. it's something we all need to face if we're going to do a career change is, 
you know, sometimes the money's not there and you make that career change. And, and, and Matt, I know you're out there in the uh, uh, running your own business world, and that's a very tough situation to first face for that first year or so. So you know this only better than anybody. Mm-hmm. But um, for us, for my wife and I, what we immediately did is we said, okay, we're going, we're going to drop a substantial amount of income here, right, going, making this move to Illinois. First thing we did is got ourselves on a budget. And that seems silly because we were in our 50s at the time that we would start with a budget. Um, but that was very useful for us. And I talk about that in the book where we do something kind of silly called budget or money dates, which are monthly. Uh, usually end of the month, we, my wife and I go out to a nice restaurant. We always have wine, something that makes it much more enjoyable. And we talk about where we're at with our financial goals. And, and at the time when we first made that career change, we were actually just we were literally looking at our monthly budget and say, okay, why did we spend $200 more than our uh, dining budget would allow? You know, it's pretty nitpicky, quite honestly. But I think that process helped us to realize, okay, we're, we're working with less money. We just need to adjust our lifestyle accordingly. And that's not easy for a lot of us to do, myself included. But my wife and I adjusted that first year pretty readily because you kind of have to, right? I mean, there's not a lot of choice, as, as you know, uh, being an entrepreneur. So I think, uh, I, th- I think that's something, you know, your listeners, it's important for them to know is you can do it. I mean, if, even if you're currently accustomed to a, a nice salary, say at $125,000 a year, you can actually live on $75,000 a year or $60,000 a year. We, we, we cut ours more than half, quite honestly. So I think it's, uh, mm-hmm. it, it can be done. You just have to make sure you work through it. Yeah, if you, if you know at the end of the day that's going to make you happy and that's the direction you really want to go, you tried it out for a little bit and you just, you, yeah. know, you have, you know, complete conviction that this is what you need to do. And that's it. You just do it. It's yeah, a, I think you said that really well, though. I mean, is, is, is I think my wife and I were like, okay, so we're making less money, but we are so much happier because we were spending more time together. We were doing more things together. We were going to mm-hmm. play different sports, which we had never done before as togetherness. And we did a lot of bicycling and so forth. There's, we were University of Illinois, but there was football games and other sporting events. It was just amazing that the time we had freed up, even though we were making less money, it was a much more fruitful life for us. Mm-hmm, I bet. So you went on money dates to talk about all the different finances. I'm guessing... <laughs> By the way, my wife hates those. Most, most, <laughs> most women will not care for that idea. <laughs> yeah. I have not pitched the idea to my wife yet, but what more <laughs> can my way up to? Slowly, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but like when you start thinking about those money dates, like how, how does that get structured? So get my glass of wine. We sit down together at a table. Like, what yeah. Money so like? I, I'll tell a funny story. I, I had a young couple, a gentleman I worked with, Mike Aiello at Hershey. Uh, he decided to try this money date with his wife because his wife read my book first. She went on a, a, a a beach retreat with her female friends, right? And she sent me a picture from the beach and said, oh my gosh, I love this book. We're going to we're gonna start doing money dates in a week or so. So Mike was my, my good friend who had always done the finances for his, for his household. As quite honestly happens in probably, you know, 75% of the U.S. households per my research, most, most of the males do the finances. And so they had their first money date and it was very uncomfortable. But they went to a restaurant, ordered a bottle of wine, and he started sharing uh, some of the numbers like the savings and so forth. And it, it was very awkward, they said, the first time. But now they do it every month. And now they're to the point where, for example, she's in a situation where she's, a, she's been in education for a number of years. And she's now thinking about a career change. So where did that come up at? In their money date, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he, she approached him and said, I'm thinking I need to move away from education and try another field. So I love the fact that they took the money date concept. And now it's not just talking about finances and money. It's talking about things that affect their life, like a career change. So um, my wife and I do it. We, sometimes we go out to a restaurant. And sometimes we just do it right here in the condo. We live in Philly, Matt, and just kind of make it simple. But we always seems to be wine is a, is a central component of being a successful money date. That would be one <laughs> thing I would suggest for your listeners. All right. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> Now you're, you're working on like your budget for now, but also like, you know, what do you want that retirement to look like? Right. So it's like, it's starting to plan out, you know, how long are you going to be in the workforce? And then what do you want your retirement to look like? So so there's a lot to think about, but I I like the idea where you're not always just, you know, talking about the finance piece of it, but it's the things we're going to do with it, which is I think extremely important. I mean, I love what, what, I love what my friends have done with that. They've taken it to a further step than probably I even imagined, but 
I think it's important for us to make sure we have those dedicated time periods because as we all know, we get so busy with work, with, with kids and, and with other family issues that we deal with that it's hard to really sit down and sit with your spouse and say, hey, what, how, what are we going to do in retirement? What do we, we want to do in retirement and when do we want to retire? Because we kind of just keep working. Most of us just kind of work until we, quite honestly, a lot of times it's just physically can't work anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but what I think my wife and I realized, unfortunately, due to this situation with our good friend passing at 48 was there's more to life than just work, right? I mean, that certainly is a big part of our, our lives and, and it has a lot of value to us, but there's so much more to life that you want to do. And it's usually with your family and, and obviously your spouse and, and so forth. And those things have to be talked about. They just don't happen magically. And so that's, I think, the key premise of these monthly dates, however you want to call it, money dates or budget dates, whatever. And there's an article in Wall Street Journal, I think just a couple of months ago, a good friend sent me that this seems to be a concept that's picking up across the country, um, that people are doing this more of a, a sit down away from kids and away from other people who uh, kind of distract the conversations mm -hmm. and just talk about things that you and your wife normally wouldn't talk about in the household, as silly as that sounds. Yeah, I think it's a really smart concept. and. It you do need to plan it out. I mean, I think you even say it in the book where it's like, you know, planning to fail is, uh, <laughs> is, you know, well, failing to plan is yeah. fail, uh, planning to fail. I used to always mess that one up. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy one. Cause it's so easy to get the plan and the fail messed up. But, you know, I think, I think for my wife and I, and I talk about this in the book, I talk about retirement preparation. And I think mm -hmm. it's important for us to realize that retirement just doesn't happen. Right. I mean, I think there's, I think when I was in my thirties, quite honestly, I had this magical feeling that, at age 65 or whatever, I would just magically retire and there'd be a nice little uh, retirement fund saved up that I've been putting away for years and, and life would be grand, right? That's not that how it works. It doesn't happen that easily. So oh, no. I think it is something we need to plan for. And I think it's something we all need to like sit down and figure out what age we'd like to retire at. And is that realistic? And can we, can we formulate a plan that gets us there? Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something that I didn't realize until probably about, you know, five years ago or so when I was in my early 30s. I'm like, yeah, like, it'll, it'll work out. I, I got a 401k. Or... <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, to be honest, though, I've had people in their 50s who have commented on the book, Matt, and said, geez, I wish I had read Checkmate when I was in my 30s. Because yeah. quite honestly, because of, you know, putting money away for your college, edu kids' education, so forth. A lot of people don't even think about doing that retirement savings until they're in their 50s. And then it's yeah. a lot to catch up on. Yeah, you're always focused in on what's happening right now. So you don't really right. think about, you know, I'll, I'll think about 30 years, you know, in 10 years from now. But all of a sudden it starts to creep up on you really fast. Yeah, this is this is something I talk about in the book a little bit. But the scary concept for us, I think, as Americans is we don't really have an educational system that helps us with personal finance. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mentioned in the book, I think there were up to like 13 states out of 50 in the U.S. require that there's a financial uh, personal finance courses before they graduate. And I think Florida was one of the most recent states to uh, push that through. It's a great concept, but think about mm -hmm. that. Only 13 out of 50 do it. So we just don't seem like we have that premise of a financial educational base at all. A lot of stuff we have to kind of do on our own. And, yeah. you know, for retirement, we talk about this three legged stool in the book where there's savings, pensions, and social security, right? Well, you think about it, and I mentioned this, I think it's like 70% of the households in the U.S. don't even have enough money to, to, to spend on a $400 uh, repair in their house. They don't have that cash available. Mm -hmm. So savings, we're not something we're real good at in this country. B, pensions have been out the door for years. They've been replaced by 401k plans, which are great. But I find two things wrong with 401k. The onus is on us to where we invested a lot, and that we're not good at that because we've not been trained for that. And B, a lot of people, and I, I quote this in the book, a lot of people don't even put enough in that savings plan for 401k plans to get the company match. Mm -hmm. There's like billions of dollars that are on the sidelines because we don't hit that match. So we're kind of left with Social Security, and that's not something we should be 100% dependent on. Yeah. Yeah. So the one leg of the stool that is certain to, to help <laughs> us in our future, which is our savings we're not properly building that one leg of the stool. <laughs> no, and, and, yeah. and not to get into the social security aspect of it, but to be honest, it's a scary concept. We know we have politicians in DC who are 
trying to fix this problem, but we're not real good right now about fixing some of these major issues. Yeah. So there is some uh, real concern down the road when we get into like 2035 and beyond whether it'll be fully funded. So hopefully we'll yeah. fix that. So if people were to plan a little bit more on the retirement side, that definitely I think will drive down into the happiness as well, right? So it's like if we know, okay, we're we're saving, we know we're going to have that, that planned out. That's one less thing to worry about. Now I can focus on being happy with my family and mm-hmm. and uh, family today, and then also focusing in back onto that work and making sure that you're you're happy uh, with, with yeah. the work that you're doing. I think I think it's you know you think about it, it's a whole bunch of pieces of the puzzle, right? That mm-hmm. have to kind of fall in line. And as you said, when I was in my thirties, like you, I, I really didn't think of retirement. I really didn't. I mean, I married at age thirty, so I was kind of late in that in that aspect. But I just. I just got a job. I just worked every day. I put money in the 401k. And like, like you said earlier, I figured it would all work out when I got to age 65, right? That was my planned retirement. But we're not good about planning that far out. I mean, we just aren't trained for that, unfortunately. So I think for your listeners, it's important to realize no matter what your age is, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s, you have to think about where you want to be down the road. And maybe that's 20, 30, 40 years down the road, but think about where you'd like to be. And for a lot of people, you know, you know, and you're perfect since you live in Florida, Matt, people think I want to live in Florida. I want to be, I want to be retired and live in Florida the rest of my right life. And that's a great thing to think about, but it just doesn't happen magically. So I mm-hmm. think we have to kind of set our, sit ourselves down and think about at age 35, maybe I want to retire at age 60. Here's what I like to do at that point in my career. Maybe it's a second uh, career that you'd like to envision yourself into. Um, you know, my wife and I, for example, here in Philly, have gotten very involved in social services. Uh, I'm writing some articles for another magazine. Those are things I wanted to do. And the book, quite honestly, was one of my retirement to-do lists. That's why I knocked it off early. <laughs> Get out of the way. Um, so I think you're right. You have to plan for those. And your listeners, I think, no matter what age, can do that at any point. But it's something you have to sit down and do constructively. Yeah. And it kind of goes back full circle to the beginning of this conversation where we just talked about, you know, stepping out of the day to day and really being mindful about, you know, what's the trajectory of your life? Are you living that life's passion? And then figuring out how do I start to build that? So I guess if I gave a challenge to the audience today, it's just to take a, a five minute break, just pause. <laughs> Find a spot to just be alone and really reflect on where you are in life and what are those steps that you need to take to make sure that you are happy at work, you are taking good care of your family, and taking good care of your future. I think it only takes a few minutes to really start to to, assess, to figure out exactly where you're heading and assess the situation. And then use Checkmate to figure out how do you move forward. Yeah, I think that's great advice, Matt. And I think the mindfulness part is something you can't, you can't quite honestly say enough about is, as we talked about during this discussion, it's not just going to happen magically. You have to mindfully set time aside for that. Mm -hmm. And I love your advice there. I think uh, people, if they do set that time aside and maybe do some of your breathing exercise that you've talked about before. And and I think it's in your book as well. Um, I love doing that. And that's some of the things I do even day to day. Now, if there's a major, you know, if I have a doctor's appointment coming up and I'm worried about it, I'll just sit down and meditate for a few minutes about yeah. how I'll get through that and how I just need to focus on doing healthy things in my life. So um, the mindfulness is really important. It's critical. And it's an amazing reset button for sure. But uh, Greg, this is awesome. I mean, is there any last words that you want to leave with the audience anywhere you want to send them to learn more about you? Please let them know. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd certainly encourage them to go buy a uh, check. Mode. It's out there in a couple of forms right now. It's out on Kindle. It's on the paperback like Matt has uh, in his hand. It's also out on Audible now. Um, so you can buy it on Audible or iTunes for if you like, just listen to the audiobook version. And for me, I'm, I'm uh, basically just at my email address. I hope to have a website soon. I'll try and share that with Matt whenever I do. <laughs> awesome. It will be in the show notes, I'm sure, as soon as it's done. So <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg, for being on the show today. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Innovate on Purpose. And uh, we will see you next time. All right. Thanks, Matt. Take care, everybody. Thanks. You too.